please, please find your seats. Uh, my name is Tom O'Donnell, and um, I have been requested by the participants to moderate this meeting, which I'm happy to do, and I welcome you in behalf of th those who are taking part in it. Uh, this is a, uh, an information session and discussion of the possible acquisition of the property of the Aquarian Water Company by the town of Hingham. I think before we start, I would like to suggest that we stand and take a moment of silence in memory of the people who lost their lives a year ago today in the Boston bombings and in honor of those who have bravely survived. Thank you. We have two speakers tonight. Bruce Rebuffo, the chairman of the Board of Selectmen of the town, and John Walsh, vice president of operations of the Aquarium Water Company. And the two speakers who have agreed on the format for the meeting, uh, which, is being, uh, which is being broadcast live, I'm told, on Comcast Channel 197 or Verizon Cast 31. So you will be on live TV tonight, and I imagine it will be rebroadcast from time to time. On the format, we will have opening statements of up to five minutes by each speaker. And then we will have a question period. And by questions, I think we all understand the difference between que questions and speeches. And the, this period is not for speeches, but for questions. And I really hope that you will keep them reasonably short and to the point. Then, um, and also designate the person to whom you are asking the question. And then we will call on the person designated, one or the other of our speakers, and he will have uh, up to two minutes to answer the question. And the other speaker, if he wants to do so, can have up to a minute to respond. The uh, order of speaking for the opening and closing remarks has been determined by the toss of a coin in my hand, and I will monitor the time limits on speaking and ask a speaker to conclude when the time, his time has expired. The order of speaking for the opening will be John Walsh first and then Bruce Rebuffo. So it's my pleasure to call on John Walsh. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone. And again, I'm John Walsh, Vice President of Operations for Aquarian Water Company. Uh, thank you all for attending this evening. Uh, the question before all of you is whether to spend an additional $475,000 to continue evaluating uh, the purchase of Aquarian system serving Hingham Hall and North Cohasset. Uh, the broader question is, who is better suited to run the water system? Tonight's goal is to provide you with information to help you make that determination. Uh, there are a number of topics that we in the water industry consider when we evaluate a water system, and I'd like to discuss five of those topics. The first is water supply. When we purchased this water system in 2002, it was distressed, water withdrawals had exceeded regulatory limits, and the state ordered the predecessor company to fix the problem. Uh, and we fixed that problem. Water withdrawals are now 300,000 gallons per day, less than they were in the late 1990s. As shown in this graph, water withdrawals have remained below the regulatory limit for the past 10 years. 
The second topic is water quality. We produce high quality water uh, that consistently exceeds regulations. For example, this graph shows turbidity of the water we, we produce. Turbidity is a matter, measure of the particles in the water, and it's most, one of the most important measures of water quality. Lower turbidity is better. As you can see, we produce water that is much better than regulatory limits. And this doesn't happen easily. Our operations staff here in Hingham work with our water chemistry staff in Connecticut to get this right. Uh, at the same time, we've achieved uh, we've also reduced cost of treating water. For example, this year our chemical costs are 15 percent less than last year despite our chemical prices increasing and the cost to dispose of sludge, which is a byproduct of the treatment process, is down 40 percent from last year. In the interest of time, um, I won't go over the details of why, but I'd welcome any questions on this topic. The third topic is infrastructure investment. Since we acquired the system, in 2002, we've invested 18 million in the infrastructure in all three towns, and uh, we invest prudently, balancing the needs of the system uh, with the uh, with the need to control the cost to customers. As this graph shows, we invest across all assets in the system, and we have a capital efficiency plan that we will that will continue to guide our investment in infrastructure. The fourth topic is rates. You'll hear that our rates are fifth highest in the state, and that's correct. Uh, the reason for this is the treatment plant. The treatment plant was expensive because of local planning requirements uh, imposed by the town when it was built by the predecessor company in 1996. And today, nearly 40% of the average customer's bill is related to the treatment plant. Despite inheriting this problem, we've managed uh, We've managed to control rates such that they've increased 1.8% a year on average, compared to a statewide average of 5.2%. Now, the Department of Public Utilities controls your water rates now. Uh, when we request a rate increase, we face a rigorous review by the Department of Public Utilities across all aspects of the business. This process takes about a year, and residents in town have a say in that process. Um, under town ownership, the DPU disappears uh, and rates can be set in one meeting uh, and without necessarily any in input from uh, residents. The final topic is unaccounted for water. You'll hear that our unaccounted for water is 21%. And I've heard people say that that's all leakage. There's a reason it's called unaccounted for water instead of leakage. That's because it's uh, not leakage alone. Unaccounted for water includes beneficial usage at hydrants for firefighting and training for firefighting. Beneficial usage at hydrants to fill street sweepers and trucks for flushing sewer lines. It includes theft, it includes meter errors, and it does include leaks on the water mains and services. We agree that 21% unaccounted for water is too high. And what we've learned owning and operating 80 water systems is that you have to look at all the causes of unaccounted for water to solve the problem. These are some of the issues I think you should consider when evaluating if the acquisition of the water system makes sense. Uh, thanks, and I will now turn it over to Chairman Rebuffo. Thank you. Um, so we now will hear from Bruce Rebuffo, the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, John. And thanks all, to all of you for coming out on a wonderful night of spring. and. They tell me at 6 o'clock it's going to snow tomorrow morning. Um, in 20 days, I step down from this office, and the purpose of this evening is to give you the information for our town meeting to pursue whether we should continue this study. There is no benefit to me personally by pursuing this. The benefit is to all of us as citizens. Let me start at the beginning. When I paid, first became a selectman in 2008, the town's fund balance stood at 8.9% of gross expenditures. That fund balance is, in effect, the town's saving account. That 8.9% was low by evaluation standards of those companies that rate us, and our AAA rating was in jeopardy. Over the last six years, through the help of many people, many of whom are sitting in this room, we brought that number back. And that number is now at 18.05%. 
of net expenditures. Back in May, we had another problem, and it was called OPEB, Other Pension Employee Benefits. It was benefits we committed to paying our town, our town and its employees. At the time, in May of 2008, it was $65 million unfunded. We tackled that number to get us back on, on track, and now as part of our regular operating budget, we fund those OPEB benefits as a continuation and con of our obligation to our employees. I raise these two examples of our fund balance and OPEB because it gets to another point. Selectmen not only worry, as many of you have seen, we worry a lot about potholes and other things like that, but we also worry about long-term problems. Fund balance was one, OPEB was another, and the water company is one of those problems. This all started when a Carrarian refused to fix a series of leaks on Union Street. We were told at the time by John's predecessor that they simply didn't have the money to fix them. And as you can imagine, that didn't sit well with the folks who live on Union Street or Free Street, and I can tell you, nor did it sit well with our town fire chief. The answer from Aquarian at the time was that we had to raise rates to fix the problem. And that started in 2007, shortly after McQuarrie, Aquarian's owner, took over control of the company. In 2009, Aquarian asked for 37% increase in rates, and the DPU granted them 20, 21%. Three years later, in 2012, they asked for 18.7%. The DPU granted them only 10. But they granted them with this statement. The amount sought by the company was not supported by the evidence in the case. So when you look at the long term, you may hear the long term rate increases. You should look at them in the context of 2007 to the present. So with the service problems we were having and the rate increases that were occurring, the Board of Selectmen at the time decided to take a review of the 1879 statute and get some people together and to look at it. We picked a unique committee, four chairman, former chairman of the advisory committee and the head of our sewer commission. And you know the strength that they bring to the table. And that's a credit to our town moderators, both Tom O'Donnell and Michael Puzo, who make sure we get people who are totally independent in their thinking. This group, their first issue was to get to the price. And with the assistance of two independent experts, we believe that the purchase price should be in the range of 50 to $60 million. Although that sounds like a lot of money, it actually leads to an average cost savings of about 2.6 to $3.2 million per year. And that means over the next 21 years, our ownership could mean an, a savings of approximately 50 to $70 million. Obviously, that's big money at stake for us and even, the, and even bigger money at stake for them. In addition, though, to their credit, Aquarian has reduced our water, our water rates twice. 900,000, right after we voted to the first $320,000 to study the issue, and three years after interest rates started to fall. Additionally, recently they announced a 3% decrease, $400,000, but that's a one-time de decrease. My point in mentioning that number to you is the fact that that, that total of $1.3 million is reflective of the money we've invested, the three hundred twenty plus the one fifty. And there's been another issue that's been out, misinformation about how we went through the process of getting through this. The, an accusation has been made that we did this almost entirely in executive session. That is not the case. The Water Company Committee, John Asher, Josh Krumholtz, Joe Beerworth, Ed Siegfried, and Michael Salerno, they had nine public sessions and eight executive sessions. The Board of Selectmen had eight public sessions and seven executive sessions. The advisory committee had three public sessions and two executive. But the committees, in all cases, 
posted their documents, the updates, the PowerPoints, all has been online and is on our website for you all to see. Obviously, the claims that this was done behind closed doors is a little, pers a little upsetting to many of us. But the long hours of work have continued, and we're at the point now of asking you to continue to sustain this effort because we believe in the long-term interests of the town, this is the course to take. Thank you. Thank you. We now come to the question period. If you would like to ask a question of either speaker, please raise your hand when I get through explaining this. <laughs> and when you are recognized by the moderator, a microphone will be swiftly brought to you. And then please state your, state your name, speak clearly into the microphone so it can be picked up by the broadcast as well as those of us in the room. And uh, state your question and the person of these two that we would like to respond to your question. We will try to all, you have alternative questions between the two speakers, so neither one of them is getting all the fire. <laughs> the speaker to whom the question is addressed will have two minutes to answer the question. And then the other speaker, if he wishes to, will have up to one minute to respond. If there are any questions addressed to both speakers, we will have up to two minutes for each of them to answer the question. If a question to a speaker involves a matter on which the speaker believes one of his professional colleagues is better informed, he may ask the colleague to respond in his stead. So with that, we will invite you to volunteer to ask a question. Yes. Let's wait till we get a mic to you. Please give your name and then Susan which one Earl, of them. Susan Earl, 18 Fresh River Avenue, Hingham. Hold it close to you, mic. Susan Earl, 18 Fresh River Avenue, Hingham. My question to the selectman chairman. Did you take into account maintenance costs, additional personnel, <clears throat> and their uh, required social security accounts and everything else to boot in your savings? Yeah, the simple answer is... Is this for both of them? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Actually, Mr. Mr. Buffalo. Select. Okay, go ahead. Go. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Susan, the answer to your question is a simple yes. Um, we, we took a number of different uh, cost uh, savings, and we took the cost, the cost to the town to take this on. And in fact, some of the costs that we, um, that we might have, or the savings that we might uh, lose, for example, taxes uh, that they pay us, we put that back into the equation. So all of our costs include all of the factors that go into the savings and the expenses the town would in, in, uh, encounter. Okay, another question. Oh, do I have a minute? Hmm? Do I get to oh, you? Oh, of course you get Sorry. a minute. Sorry. Um, so I think on this issue of the cost uh, of, to the town or towns uh, to run the system, beyond any prudent business decision is a robust financial analysis. And that analysis includes assumptions, in this case assumptions about how much it will cost the town to operate the system. The town has provided me with that information in the form of um, a comparison of what costs they could reduce uh, from the way, from uh, the cost for us to run the business. It's my understanding that the town has not shared that with residents, um, and I think that you should ask for that information. It would allow me, you to make your own assessment um, of whether, in particular, you know, maintenance costs are included. Uh, and additional personnel costs are included in the estimate. Thank you. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is uh, Phil Lemnios. I'm the town manager of Hull. In, in uh, the opening statement from Aquarian, there were kind of five standards laid out as to why uh, Hingham ought to uh, reject the notion of acquiring Aquarian. Two of them are regulatory, water quality and water supply, that anybody is going to have to meet. So I kind of look at those as red herring issues. Um, whoever operates the system will have to meet those under DEP. The infrastructure question was intriguing uh, because in probably a 10-year period, there's about $2 million of infrastructure invested on average, and that's a different question. Rates were the, was really the heart of my question. Uh, the Aquarian representative in, indicated that basically 40% of the current rate structure is due solely to the presence of the new water treatment facility. A, is there documents to back that up? And B, how much does Aquarian make annually, or one of the Aquarian companies make annually from leasing that property back to themselves? And how much lower would the rate be if they did not lease that property back to themselves? So in essence, they're saying it's Hingham's fault for asking for a quality product, so it's everybody in town's fault for doing that. And oh, by the way, we're going to charge ourselves some rent. So what is the rent on that property back to Macquarian or Aquarian or the number of different companies that are affiliated under the same umbrella? John? Uh, sure. On the first question of the, uh, and it's nearly 40 percent, is of the average bill, is, yeah, yes, um, uh, the, the average bill has the surcharge for the plant broken out. So anyone can look at the, there's a couple line items on their bill related to the treatment plant. And anyone can uh, do the math on that to determine how much those line. I can, I have a copy of that calculation here, but I think it's probably too much detail. To well, the, the average bill now is I believe it's around 700 and, well, let me give you the exact number, $733 a year. And that's based on 62,500 gallons per day uh, used by customers. And that was the average usage by customer in Hingham and Hull at the last rate case. So 62,500 gallons per year comes to $733 a year. Um, so that backup is built, is right on folks' bills. The other question on the, the lease for the treatment plant, um, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but I can say that, that the treatment plant went through the same rigorous process with DPU, Department of Public Utility, that um, our regular rates go through. So in 1996, when the treatment plant was built, uh, they reviewed the cost uh, and all of the rates uh, behind all the rates that would be uh, put in place. Bruce, uh, thank you. If I may, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, back to the first question that Susan asked, uh, that lease payment amounts to, to a 13% charge, a lease payment, 13% charge from the American Water, uh, correction, from the Aquarian Water Capital to the Aquarian Water Company. And in dollars, that represents about a million dollars to us. That goes away. OK, another question. I'm going to take someone else, and we can get back to you. Yes, sir, over here. Hi, my name is Tim Collins. Um, I live on Cushing Street. My first question is to Mr. Walsh and the Aquarian Company. Having owned the assets of the company for 10 years, uh, Aquarian certainly has a perspective on what the maintenance and infrastructure of the company looks like. Um, I'm obviously, when you acquired the company, you knew what the treatment plant was worth or wasn't worth or what was overvalued and assumed your corporation acquired it accordingly with the purchase price. So having run the company for 10 years um, and there being such a wide variance in the numbers, the valuation metrics that the town has ascribed to the company's assets in terms of what you have ascribed to them, having run it for 10 years, what is the long-term, you know, remediation issues with underwater, I mean, underground pipelines and water interconnects and main lines? Is there a maintenance issue 
that's actively been managed for 10 years by Aquarium. So you know what projects and capital are going to be required to run the company in the next three, five-year plan, 10-year plan. I mean, as a business, you guys must have a perspective on that. What's the scope of that? And the second question is to the, to the uh, selectmen, which is, you know, what is the plan for the operations of this company being acquired by the town? What is the infrastructure? Where is the expertise? I mean, running a public utility requires a significant amount of expertise that has to be acquired. And it's unclear whether or not those assets are coming by themselves to the town, potentially, or with resources, or that's going to have to all be replicated. And, and the last question to both of you is, uh, sorry, I don't mean to take, I'm going to try and get my two minutes in here. Uh, the last question to both of you is, in standard M&A transactions, when people acquire or sell assets, there's usually some commonality in interest. And you guys seem to both have such a divergent interest of, of parties, Macquarie, Aquarian, and the town. What's the basis of that? What, is it a contract issue? Is it a potential valuation issue? Is it an operating issue? You know, so. Okay, John, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure needs, um, the infrastructure across the three towns, uh, the primary components of it are the treatment plant, uh, which was uh, built for about $36 million. Uh, there's two tanks, two large water storage tanks in the system, one near Accord Pond and one near Turkey Hill. And then there's the, um, the distribution system piping it's 190 miles of pipe. Uh, so in terms of the greatest need, uh, especially in terms of dollars, uh, the distribution system is where the money uh, is most needed. Uh, we have what we call a capital efficiency plan uh, that evaluates every uh, segment of pipe in the system uh, in terms of its age, its materials of construction, um, its break history, uh, its soil conditions, uh, and a couple other factors. Using all those factors, we run them through a model uh, determ to determine what are the highest priority water mains to replace. The result was uh, a list of 27 prioritized projects uh, that amounts to about $15 million worth of work that needs to be done. And uh, we are planning, or we are in the midst of um, prudently and in a measured manner replacing uh, those water mains. It will take time to replace $15 million uh, worth of water main, um, but we believe in doing it in a measured manner. Uh, also on the list are the two tanks. Both tanks, both in Hingham, uh, need to be uh, rehabilitated, which is mostly painting, uh, sandblasting and painting those tanks. Uh, and they're on the schedule in the next couple of years to rehabilitate and they're between 750 and a million dollars to rehab each of those tanks. So, Bruce, um, I, may I respond to John's question first? Or, Go ahead. Um, All right. The only thing I would like to add to John's comment is in 2012, they promised us they would spend $1.4 million. They spent 985. That is the issue that has been part of the sum and substance of our discussion. The infrastructure, I agree with him on the issue of it's the distribution system. Um, if I may, to your second question, to me, about a plan. Um, the committee looked carefully at this. You don't grow the resources internally to run a water company. And in their research and analysis, they, they examined a number of alternatives, but the one that caught their fashion was the way Cohasset runs its. Woodward and Curran, is the company that runs it. Um, on uh, their behalf, um, we would engage in somebody like that, and outsourcing would be the terminology we would use. Uh, we've had some discussions with them and others, and their um, observation after their review of the analysis of the, of the company is that they could do it at a considerable cost, less than what Aquarian can. Okay. 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 Another question from someone else. Um, uh, you had, excuse me, you, you, you had a question for both of us? Okay, well, let's, I mean, I'll, I'll let it have a brief, who do you want to ask that to? 
Okay. All right. Take take a brief. You've had a lot of questions. We'll okay. go. Okay. We'll go on this one. We're go we're, ahead. we're doing an evaluation method um, uh, to determine the the price. Uh, it's a question of a whole bunch of economic issues that we could go on till midnight if you want to look at all the alternatives. Uh, but that's the primary reason why we disagree. It's the interpretation of the 1879 statute. Um, I would add to that, if I may, uh, think of this. I worked for the Bell System, if you always remember the Bell System. Um, the, the Aquarian Water Company was established about three years after Alexander Graham Bell founded the phone. Such things as depreciation, federal income taxes, or, uh, those were concepts that did not exist. So that's part of the deliberative process and why we disagree. Uh, the the purchase price of the system is set forth by a charter that was passed in 1879. And the charter is like a contract and it contains a formula that must be followed by the town if it wishes to purchase the system. And the town and Aquarian have different interpretations of that charter. Uh, thus the town um, chose to pursue, file a lawsuit. Um, so that means at some point the meaning of the charter uh, will be determined by the courts. Okay, let's have another, Mr. Ross. Uh, Nelson Ross, 18 Bradford Road. First of all, Mr. Rebuffo, I want to thank you for your service. Thank You've you. uh, been a wonderful selectman. Thank you. Um, I'm interpreting the, the comment in the town meeting warrant uh, that says that the cost through trial will be 475000 Would you put it close to your miles now? $475,000. That that, we know that that is the cost through trial, or um, should we assume it's a best estimate? Uh, my second question is, assuming that uh, the town loses with regard to its position regarding valuation, would um, uh, the selectmen uh, be recommending the purchase of the water company if it cost $184.5 million? All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Nelson. And uh, I, I always like to leave after the applause, so. <laughs> Uh, the, um, if the price is $184.5 million, I will have no hair on my head completely. No, we would not recommend that. What is the, night, what is the number? I think that's why we're in the Supreme Judicial, uh, or in the uh, Suffolk County Court business litigation session, because as John said, they will determine, they will determine the price. Um, to um, your other question, um, was, if you wouldn't mind. Litigation cost, uh, The breakdown of the 475 is primarily for two components, the litigation component and the expert component. We need people to testify on our behalf who can respond to the, how they determine the price and why they determine the price. Yes, it's the best estimate to carry it through to trial. And I should add, if I may, since you've opened the door, the, the Water Study Committee uh, underspent the initial estimate of $320,000. It was only when we were unsuccessful in negotiating a solution to the problem that's the reason we've had to come back. Okay, another question. Mrs. English. Edna English, uh, 36 Gardner Street. Close to the uh, okay, can you hear me now? I know the. Yeah. It's funny with the mic. My question is really um, uh, related to Nelson's question, and that is what timeline do you anticipate? Uh, it relates to uh, both of you in terms of the 475,000 that you're requesting. Is that the end of it, or will there be appeals? And when do you expect uh, a result from the court? What, what do we have to look forward to as, as we proceed through the process? Okay. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you, Edna. 
Uh, I think the question, if I may, I'm sure many of you would be concerned by what the town of Oxford just went through, a four-year trial. And um, I should tell you we are on an expedited schedule. We are in the discovery phase right now, and while that has said, I would say, some minor delays associated with it, we anticipate that we would be in trial sometime in 2015. And um, if, and therefore, the, the trial would then determine the price. Uh, in terms of the schedule, I don't have much more to add. The, uh, uh, the court has set the schedule through uh, the fall of this year. Beyond that, there is no schedule from the court. Another question. Yes, Kathy. Uh, there are Kathy Reardon, uh, Steamboat Lane in Hingham. Um, there are many in the environmental community in Hingham, people who are particularly concerned with, with Hingham's environment and, and also with uh, the water uh, quantity that we have in Hingham and the quality of the water and the impact of uh, withdrawal of water on our natural resources, streams and, and uh, wildlife and so on. Um, could you both elaborate on the types of programs that you would be willing to um, promote, uh, hopefully commit to, to deal with uh, the, the issue of the impact of water drawdown on uh, the natural resources of the town? Sure. Uh, over the last 12 years, we've been able to control the water withdrawals, uh, keep them underneath uh, the DEP registration limit with a couple different programs. Uh, one of them is the water balance program, which requires developers to offset their projected usage with reductions in usage at uh, existing facilities. Uh, I think that program should definitely continue, and I, I think actually the state is looking to um, use that uh, across other water utilities in the state, so they've found that it works. Um, another uh, program or activity that has worked, I think, for us is water restrictions in the summer, uh, limiting, limiting irrigation to every other day. Um, I don't know that everyone adheres to uh, that request um, when we put it out there, so uh, I think it would be beneficial if Aquarian and the town worked together and there was a bylaw regarding irrigation uh, systems. I think those are the two uh, biggest. Uh, yes, okay, sorry. Uh, one more item. Okay. So in terms of unaccounted for water, I brought up unaccounted for water. And again, it's 21% of our water. It's too high. Uh, we're uh, conducting a, uh, a comprehensive water audit right now that's looking at all those categories of unaccounted for water uh, so we can identify where the issues are and we can resolve those uh, problems, whether it's with meters or uh, hydrant usage or, um, or leakage. Bruce? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was writing feverishly. I, I can't read my own writing, so I can imagine that. Um, let me start with the number. Uh, John just referenced the unaccounted for water. It's 253 million gallons. That's the 21 percent. If we got to the state standard at 10 percent, that's 130 million dollars, uh, 130 million gallons that comes back to the watershed if we're successful. We met with the DEP. They were very concerned about the water withdrawal rate. That was the first issue. They wanted assurances from us that we would not exceed that arrangement, that number. In addition uh, that to that commitment that we made, we also asked them at the time, were there any showstoppers that would prevent us or any commitments that had been made that would prevent us from attain by attaining the system that would cause us to ca cause damage? And the answer was no. And they've given us a number of other suggestions that we could employ in terms of, um, and the, the committee has started to look at issues such as stormwater management, the loss of water that we spill into the ocean uh, as we do today, 
and the, also the issue surrounding um, how could we encourage people on water conservation. Uh, Aquarian has unfortunately the issue every summer. Since I, I want you to know when I moved here, the, the developer tried to get me to install a water system so I could water my lawn when I suddenly realized I live in a desert. I can't, I don't have the water to, to, to do it. And uh, therefore we installed landscaping to, to prevent the use of, of water. We would like to encourage the people to do that as well and as part of the program. Thank you. Another question. Peter. This is a two-pronged question. Give your name, uh, Peter. Both, uh, Peter Stephopoulos, Volusia Road. Troublemaker. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the things was that, uh, Bruce, you've always quoted a figure of $914. Close to you. $914 and makes us the fifth highest uh, cost. Then uh, Mr. Walsh says it's $733. That's a, 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 a wide range. But uh, the thing is that if we took out the cost of the treatment plant, what would be the cost of the water? Now, it's using facts that support an argument and I just question it. And one side issue, of 14 meetings by the committee, 12 of them were executive session as posted on the web. All right, now I could be wrong, I could go through it again, but I'm concerned about the selling point of $914 makes us the fifth highest. And what would be the rate per cubic foot usage? How much is industrial, how much is household rates? Etc. So this is from Mr. Rebuffo, right? Well, actually, if, if he has an explanation for why right. uh, John said 733, we have two figures. Okay, we'll start. We'll and start. And I'll say Rebuffo should be the first one to. Okay. I'm asking a question of because he's the one that's come up with the 900 and some odd dollars. Okay. Bruce. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, the number is not 914; it's 919. And that number is based on uh, the number at the, t at the beginning of the study, which is a year and a half ago. It's the last I've seen that. John, and again, as you can imagine, as John referenced, there's a lot of different ways to compute it. There's no dispute that we have among the highest water rates in the Commonwealth. And I would, though, if there's anybody here from Cohasset, they can tell you that they pay about 60% of what we pay for water. John? Uh, yeah, first on that last comment, I think Cohasset is the highest rates in the state. Um, I'm going to have to check that. The, uh, the difference between the 919 and the 733 is, um, uh, I'm assuming that the 919 is coming from uh, a study done every two years by a consulting firm called Time Bond. They do a, a study of all water utilities across the state and they use for their assumed usage per customer 90,000 gallons per year of usage. When they started doing the study probably 10, 15 years ago, that may have been a reasonable number, but it's not what customers use now. So we use, for our figures, um, the 62,500 gallons per year, which is actually what people use in, uh, in the three towns here. So that's the difference between the 919 and the 733. Okay, another question. Someone? Yes, ma'am. Mary Jean Schultz, currently on Sunset Point in Hull. I, um, certainly the gist of the committee's work has been to do a cost-benefit analysis of um, whether or not to buy the water company. I would be interested in that analysis to know the projections the committee made for the costs and the resources of the provision of water to Hull and North Cohasset. That's from Mr. Rebuffo, I assume. From MJ, if I understand your question, you want to know in our cost projections going forward, what the costs would, have we uh, taken into account the costs to provide water? Is that, is that? Yes, okay, 
let, that's a two-part question, if I may separate it. We do have an overall estimate for the costs. It was based on our own estimates, coupled with a discussion that we had with the president and the chairman of Aquarian, where they gave us projections out as to what the, they expected costs to be, and we compared them to our cost savings that we encounter, that we would expect. And to the second question of what would happen to Hull, what would happen to Hingham, and what would happen to Cohasset. We've had meetings with the town managers and administrators to specifically discuss that. And what we've agreed, and we have a draft of an intermunicipal agreement that says what's common into our provided provision of water, that is the water treatment plant or pipes that bring the water to Hull and Cohasset, that we would pay for collectively and that the decision to what they would do with their individual water uh, infrastructure within the borders of their town, that would be the decision of the town to do so that they could control their own development. And the reason for that thinking is that we have heard when Hingham does something to develop South Hingham Industrial Park to prevent for its own commercial and tax benefits, the people of Hull could be rightly concerned about that. And likewise, a similar issue would be if Hull wanted to do something to improve the pipes on Nantasket Avenue, uh, they would like to be able to deal with that without having to come back to Hingham. John? So if I, if I heard the question correctly, it's a matter of what is Hingham going to be charging Hull and North Cohasset residents? Um, I think that ans the answer is probably within that draft intermunicipal agreement. Uh, but the devil is in the details, and if I was a Hull resident or I was a North Cohasset resident, I would want to see those details um, because if the town of Hingham acquires the system, you will no longer be protected by the Department of Public Utilities when it comes to rate making. And uh, the vast majority of your bill will be controlled um, by another town, so your voice I would expect maybe limited. Another question. Uh, Mr. Moderator, yeah. before you go to that, yeah, so go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I just want to get go ahead. The, the point of this is the control of the water rates would pass to the people directly. There would be no DPU. There would be no process that we would go through. We would go through the, the people to decide. And I would use as an example two things that we've done in Hingham. One, our light plant and the things that we've done to preserve that. And two, what we've done with the Lincoln School Apartments, which was another business that people said we should not be in, but we stepped up to do it. So. No, but, but you would have that right within the town of Hull to decide what would happen, and the structure, the governance structure we would put in place would have representation from Hull. We haven't worked out the details as how many seats does who have for what, but the, I, the concept has been explored that we would have some mutual way to agree to with a common distribution of the water system and management of the water system, coupled with the preservation requirements that are on top of all three towns to preserve. Okay, I'm going to take another questioner. Bill Ridden. Yes, uh, Bill Reardon, Nine Steamboat Lane. So we've been talking here about uh, regulation, and, and I have a question for each of the uh, speakers about that. Uh, to Mr. Walsh, my understanding is that 95% of the towns in Massachusetts own their own water companies. So presumably there is, there is a model for um, how without, in the absence of the DPU, those towns' water rates are set, and it appears to work. And I would also ask if you know whether there are other uh, jurisdictions in Massachusetts where one town uh, or the water company in one town may go across to uh, another town similar to the Cohasset uh, Hull situation. And to uh, Mr. Rebuffo, the question, uh, and, and you, you just spoke of it, the, the people. I think, uh, since this is an information session, to clarify for the voters in Hingham, what, what is the, uh, the process of rate setting uh, that would apply to the water company? I think many of us are familiar with the, the model for the electric company in Hingham. Uh, we have elected light board members. 
Uh, could we have a little bit of clarity to the extent that the committee has looked at this in terms of um, how the structure would work in terms of overseeing the, the operations and therefore the rate setting that is going to come forward? So it's a question for each of the gentlemen. Okay. Right, begin with Bruce. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's good that you mentioned the light plant. That's, that is one structure that is, is working, and we know how that works. We see the service they provide, and we see the rates that we enjoy um, from that. Um, to get to the specifics of does Hull have two seats and Hingham have four seats, and is that the structure of the board, if that's your question, that, that detail has not been worked out yet. We have conceptually discussed that there would be a process to make sure there's representation across all three towns to that process. Um, have we gotten as far in the intermunicipal interim municipal agreement to have a veto arrangement that, uh, you know, if Hull doesn't like the rates that Hingham is proposing, how would that work? That's the detail that has yet to be worked out. But again, if I may, this is an issue about proceeding. Uh, with whether or not we should buy. We haven't made the decision yet to buy the water company. We've said we've got some good numbers that say we should pursue this and that there's benefit to pursuing it. And we've said this for 18 months that there has been no showstoppers to this. So that's what we're about. Those details will have to be discussed because if we come back with a price that's within our range, the town meetings in all three towns will have to decide that question as to the structure. And that's something we'll have to work out. That's the only way I can envision this working. Uh, I think your first question was regarding 95% uh, of towns owning the water systems. Um, one thing that people should realize is 40 million people in the U.S. Um, receive their water from private water companies. Um, and uh, like us, many of those private water companies have, have been in business for 150 plus years. Um, I guess I'd ask two um, well, consider this. Westwood Dedham, you ask a town that has a water system that covers two towns. The Westwood Dedham water system, which was, used to be a private water system, was taken over uh, decades ago uh, by the municipalities. Uh, they had a uh, board um, that, I believe it was in January 2011, raised rates 15 percent. And not only didn't they inform the residents, the selectmen in each town found out that the rates were raised 15 percent in one night at one meeting. Um, without any, without any notice to the board, to the selectmen, they learned of it in the newspaper. Um, I'd ask you to consider a couple of things regarding town ownership. Uh, our rates have increased at a much lower rate than towns over the last 12 years, and uh, also there's a water infrastructure bill uh, that's going through the legislature right now, and uh, uh, they've noted that there's, I believe, it's hundreds of bill, hundreds of millions. Uh, that towns have not invested in their infrastructure over the past decades, and now it's considered a crisis that the towns have not invested. So I'd consider both of those things when you evaluate uh, town ownership of complex infrastructure. Okay, another question. Yes, Ms. Salisbury. Thank you. Catherine Salisbury, 10 Ridgewood Road. I have uh, two questions, uh, but they're different questions, and I'd like to ask one of Mr. Rebuffo and one of Mr. Walsh. Okay, uh, Mr. Rebuffo, you're referring to the intermunicipal agreement and the discussions. Hold it that close it, to you. The, 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 excuse me, Mr. Rebuffo, you have um, referred to the discussions about the intermunicipal agreement that has gone on with. Cohasset and Hull, and my understanding, at least the initial agreement was, uh, the initial meeting was an executive session. Uh, will those discussions become public? Can the public see the draft intermunicipal agreement? Uh, can we be, um, are there minutes that people can read to find out exactly uh, what is being discussed and decided? Because as you say, um, the proceeding in the court is not finished, and it seems a little premature to be um, wrapping this up or, or even, even attempting, and whether you wrap it up or not, but you attempt it, and no one here is aware that these discussions have been going on. 
Um, my second question for Mr. Walsh is, if there were an amended motion uh, presented at town meeting um, on Article 17 on the 28th of April at town meeting, um, and if such amended motion were to pass, pausing or asking to pause this litigation, would you, uh, representing Aquarian, be willing to pause the litigation without um, any prejudice on either side so that a uh, town committee appointed by the town meeting or by the moderator representing the town meeting uh, could study this uh, for an additional year? Thank you. Bruce, thank you. To the question, Kathy, of the intermunicipal agreement, um, there have been no formal proposals drafted. There has been discussions at the Board of Selectmen's meetings in public, and those minutes are around, but no discussion. I have brought back, I as the liaison to this, have had discussions with the select, with selected selectmen in each of the towns to inform them of what we're thinking. And Ted has had discussions with the town managers and town administrators as to what we're thinking. To the governance question is why is it so premature? If you remember when we started the study, we said we were going to look at finance, governance, and engineering. When we got to the governance question, we wanted to understand what are the rules under the, under the way we have to operate in our watershed, the DEP guidelines. That, that helps define the area that we have to govern. And two, under what, what arrangements could we have? And this was one proposal we put forth as to how to deal with it. But again, until we get that price, we can't decide the structure that we're going to have in place. And back to a question that Peter answered, because he, Peter, the answer, the numbers I gave you are the numbers I gave you. I said there was eight and seven for advisory and eight, uh, pardon me, for the Water Study Committee and the same numbers about for the, for the selectmen. Um, I don't know where you get the 14 number, Kathy, of executive sessions. Uh, they were online. We've just, I recently checked those numbers just to be sure since some people had raised the question. We did a recount. The town administrator and his staff did that for me. Uh, those are the numbers we have. All of those meetings that are in the public sessions are on the website, and all of the deliberations are on the website. John, I'm going to let you get in a minute. Sure. I think the, the first question was regarding um, whether we would uh, delay or postpone the litigation. Uh, I don't think I can answer uh, that question. Um, so I can't answer that one. Um, to some of the comments um, regarding governance, I'll give you an example of uh, when I say the devil's in the details. Um, unaccounted for water. Let's assume it's still an issue um, after the town buys the system or becomes an issue. And um, let's assume that, the, uh, uh, that it's assumed the problem is in Hull, that there's a leaky main somewhere in Hull. Um, the question would be, who does DEP uh, come after? Well, Hingham's going to be owning the system. So they'll come after Hingham about the unaccounted for water issue uh, but the issue may not may be in Hull. So uh, when it comes to that intermissible agreement, things like that have to be considered. What authority would Hingham have over Hull residents to force them to solve a problem like a leak? Thank you. Uh, can I, Mr. Moderator, if I may just uh, answer something uh, that John just said? Um, when we buy the water company, if, if we buy the water company, the money f to pay us back for that will be paid by all three towns. Um, we will be reimbursed in the water rates by all three towns. That means there has to be a structure in place that gives representation to all three towns in the decision process. That is the, that is the, way, the only way that this can proceed on a going forward basis in the watershed environment in which we live, live today. Okay, another question. Yes, sir, near the back. Uh, hi, Mark Lucas, uh, Harvest Lane, Hingham. I just had a question uh, directed toward the 
chairman of the board, and you can pro probably provide me some information. In terms of the amount of money that's already been sunk into this process, uh, I assume that you needed engineers, attorneys, financial analysts to kind of evaluate this. Uh, if you can give us an idea of how much has already been allocated to that, and then assuming that there isn't re rate regulation needed going forward, but there is, I assume they're going to be into municipality agreements, how much money are we going to need in order to, how much money will be allocated, I guess, in order to maintain that? Okay. Bruce? Oh, yes, okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, the town voted in 2012 $320,000. The, this year, the advisory committee, on the, upon the request of the selectmen, um, added $150,000. Uh, that was because we had taken that money out of the original request, assuming we could negotiate sex successfully with, um, with Aquarian. That did not prove uh, profitable at the time, so there's $150,000 on top of the 320. And in addition, the 475 would include all of the expenses we anticipate for all of the, all of the uh, uh, workings that we have to do to, to bring this to closure. Uh, so that is not, I said litigation, that's primarily where the intermunicipal agreement would be a subset of that. Uh, that's all of the evaluation numbers that would be, a, would be included in that as well. Okay. I don't have anything to add okay. to that. Yes, ma'am, over here. Samantha Woods. Uh, Gosnell Street and Hull, and board member of the Weir River Watershed Association. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, earlier uh, the need for conservation, and we are um, have known for over a decade now that the watershed is over withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And my question really is to the town of Hingham: uh, What's stopping you? You know, I think that there are things that you can do now, mm -hmm. and could have been doing over the last decade. Uh, you don't need to own the water company to do some of these things, and so I'd like to hear uh, what you could take on now. And I also have, since we get multiple questions, one other question. Is there any loss of uh, tax revenue to the town of Hingham from purchasing the uh, water company? Do they pay any property tax to you now? Sure, sure. Let me, let me take the second question first. Um, when a town owns a utility, the arrangement that we normally enter into, which is what we've done on the light plant, is something called a pilot, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, what that number would be would obviously be something that would be negotiated with whatever the structure is that uh, would govern the water company if the town were to take it over. Uh, to, the, to the issue of the environment, we have done some things in Hingham in terms of purchasing land near or around the Ware River watershed. Um, when we initiated this study, um, those things continued with CPC funds and other activities that we've engaged in. Uh, but there's obviously more that we could do, and that's the issue that uh, collectively that we would, would do. And by the way, whether we own it or Aquarian owns it, I think that's the discussions we've been having with all of the environmental folks. Uh, that, that, that is an issue we have to address. Um, our purpose initially was to look at, the, as I said, the governance, economic and engineering questions to see, get those first. We've now started to delve deeply into the environmental issues, as I mentioned, in the, some of the meetings that we've been having with the state, and that's the course we're on right now. Okay. Tom, can I add a rebut to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, sure. sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, Samantha, I, I believe at uh, one point in time, um, I wasn't uh, working in the system at the time, there was a proposal to implement a bylaw regarding irrigation. Some of the water supply committee members in Hingham will probably remem remember that. So I don't know where that stopped in the process. Uh, but that type of collaboration between uh, Aquarian and the town, I think, is valuable uh, in terms of uh, um, in, um, facilitating or encouraging uh, con conservation. On the um, uh, since the tax issue came up, we pay property taxes um, of about $629,000 a year uh, to the town of Hingham. Um, and we also pay property tax in Hull as well. 
Um, just as a point of note, between our rate cases in 2008 and in 2012, when our rates went up 10%, um, our property taxes from the town of Hingham went up 15%. So part of what's behind, you know, we have real cost in the business when our rates go up. In this case, our rates went up less than our property taxes went up uh, during that same intervening three years. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, Phil Emnios, Phil M. Niels, uh, town manager at Hull. Um, just a quick observation. Uh, um, I've heard very little specific detail from Aquarian tonight, a lot of generalities, but holding that aside, Mr. Walsh, can you explain to this audience why in every community that you are operating in Massachusetts, each one of those communities is trying to evict you from ownership? Uh, I think in terms of the first comment on details, um, feel free to ask for any details that you think are missing. Uh, I think I've been specific on a number of topics. Um, in terms of the towns taking us over, uh, Millbury, uh, their town manager uh, in public has made note that he does not, has no interest in owning and running a water system. Um, so, and I don't, you'd have to ask Hingham uh, leadership and Oxford leadership uh, what is motivating them? Bruce? Um, I, I think, Phil, I said it in my opening remarks. My, our conversations with Oxford have been of a similar vein. And as you know, Oxford got a ruling from the, uh, from the court, and they have to go back to the town, and they are going back to the town in order to buy the water company, even though the price is higher than what they what they said. To me, that depicts a, a, a population that's very upset. Okay. okay. We have one more. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Susan, we got time. Speak into the mic. Susan Earl, 18 Fresh River Avenue. I remember when Hingham sold the uh, water company to the first buyer. And the reason why they sold it was because they didn't want to put the money into upgrading the water plant. My question to you is, can you guarantee us that you will put the money into maintaining the water plant and you will not let it uh, go to decrepit and then turn around and want to sell it again because you don't want to pay for it? upgrading the water plant. Okay. Um, first of all, let me, if I just may clarify something for history. In 1876, Governor Long tried to sell Hingham his investment in a water company, and they turned it down. It has not been in public hands ever. It's always been in private hands. Uh, to the issue of the second question, which is a good question, what guarantee do you have that we're going to keep the quality of the water um, we're at a level that we would like to see it at, and will the investment be in there? I'd like to tell one story, and the story is Hurricane Sandy. When Norwell and a lot of neighboring towns were suffering because the, they hadn't done the tree, the tree trimming, they hadn't done the preparation work, Hingham had power through all of that because we collaborated and worked closely with our light plant to make sure our DPW and the light plant forces were on the same page. As six years as selectman, I haven't seen anything to let me be convinced that it's not going to be that way in the future, whether we own the water company or we don't. Um, in terms of in investing and in maintaining infrastructure, um, I've lost count of how many facilities we have. We serve 55 communities. We have uh, 10 uh, treatment plants that are as large uh, or larger than Hingham Street and Facility. Um, we've got folks who spend decades um, planning and designing and implementing upgrades to treatment facilities. So we really know that business very well. And we do that at the Hingham facility 
We invest uh, every year in the facility. Last year, uh, we spent money on our centrifuges, which treat, uh, handle our sludge, on our generator, on the switch gear that turns on and off that generator, and on the instrumentation in our facility. And um, why that matters is um, this point about Hurricane Sandy. I'll make a similar point. In uh, February 2012, there was a blizzard uh, that knocked out power in Cohasset. And um, Cohasset Water is run by a contract operations firm, the firm that the town of Hingham is talking to about running the water system here. Uh, that firm called me on a Saturday morning because their power was out, their generator had failed, and they were going to run out of water in town. So for two days, we opened up an interconnection and we provided them with water. Now, I don't know why their generator failed. Um, we did the right thing by providing them water, but um, it's a contract operation, contract operators running that system. And um, uh, again, I don't know who's responsible for that generator failing, the town or the contract operator, and nobody had to dig into that detail, but it would have been interesting to see uh, who was pointing fingers at who if they were out of water for two days. Thank you. We've now reached the point at which I think we should move to closing statements. If the, you have a question that you would really like to pursue, uh, that's fine. It may be that one or both of our speakers will be willing to stay a little while afterwards. Um, and I'm sure you can get in touch with them at their offices, uh, Bruce at the Selectman's office and John at the, uh, through the Aquarian Company. So if there are questions that you would like, we haven't been able to cover everything. Why, by all means, take them up with them, both of them, or either of them, either in writing or by telephone. And I'm sure they will try their very best to give you good answers, which is what they've been trying to do for us all evening. So I would like now to call on them for their closing statements. And um, John, you go first. Thank you very much. Um, so Aquarian has been in the drinking water business for a long time. We've been providing drinking water to communities in New England for more than 150 years. And we've been stewards over the environment uh, since long before many people thought of the environment. And that's because we have a vested interest uh, in protecting the natural resources where we get our water. Uh, we're the water supplier to 55 cities and towns and more than 700,000 people in New England. And we're growing. Uh, we acquired uh, about 80, 80 water systems in the past three years. And it's not uncommon for local and state officials to ask that we acquire a system because of our ability to fix infrastructure problems, water quality problems, and service problems. Uh, providing safe drinking water is an important responsibility. Uh, and this is not intended to be a cute slogan. It's our business. Right now and every second of every day, we're providing uh, those 700,000 people with safe, high-quality drinking water. And there are hundreds of pieces of equipment uh, from well pumps, chemical feed systems, control systems, instrumentation, filters, and water quality analyzers that all have to operate 24-7 to make sure that we provide our customers with enough water and with water that is always high quality. Um, this means that we have to get a lot of things right. Uh, we have to have the right people, that's from our operators to our engineers to our scientists and to our regulatory specialists. And we have to have the right technology, for example, to monitor and control our treatment systems. We have to have the right procedures like those that we have in place to fix main breaks quickly and to keep residents informed during emergencies. Uh, we have to have the right practices in place, for example, our planning activities for infrastructure and infrastructure upgrades and water resources. And we have to have the right performance metrics, and those are to measure our performance across customer service, safety, and efficiency. Um, so it's a critical responsibility. We've been successfully providing water to customers, prudently investing in infrastructure and protecting the environment for many years, and we know what it takes to do it right. And we remain firmly committed to continuing to provide the 46,000 residents in Hingham Hall and North Cohasset with high quality water and service each day. Thank you very much. Bruce? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, 
this issue makes economic sense to the people who have looked at it carefully. To the question of the environmental issues, I only draw your attention to two facts. From the period when, when Kelda owned the water company, the unaccounted for water went down and there was no increase in rates. To the period from 2007, the unaccounted for water went up and you heard the numbers on what happened to our rates. I'd like to read to you a statement that you'll find in the warrant for this year's article at the, um, at the April 28th meeting. This is from the ad advisory board. The main advantages of continuing to take the steps to pursue the, the main advantages of taking the of taking to take the steps to pursue a potential town acquisition of the water company are significant cost savings that would result in lower and slower future rate increases, greater and more efficient capital investment, more direct management of the water supply, including unaccounted for water, and the attendant relief of the stressed Ware River watershed, and the stability in ownership, eliminating the inherent conflict between a private company's investment goals and municipal and ratepayer needs. I thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you very much to both speakers for presenting a lively and very informative evening for us. Thank you. You know, if, if one watches the quality of discussion on some of the television shows, in, in indeed in some of our public legislative bodies, they compare very unfavorably with the kind of civil, thoughtful comments that we've all been privileged to hear tonight. So we, we ought to be grateful for that. And the, and the subject, of course, continues at the annual town meeting uh, on the 20, 28th, I believe. And there's an important warrant article relating to this project, which you will have a chance to hear more debate and discussion, and then those of you who live in Hingham will have a chance to vote on it. So thank you all very much for coming, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you.